study and a lot of other groups around the world and here in Italy, uh, we're very much interested in studying these unique individuals who are age 100 or older who are healthy in order to understand how did they get there, right? What is it about them that allows them to live not only long but healthy lives? And sometimes people look at factors that change as we age, right? To see, well, if something is high when you're young but low when you're old, or maybe the opposite, maybe that's a driver of aging. And one such hormone is the growth hormone. Uh, that, and the name, as it implies, is that the hormone is responsible for growth. That's what allows us to grow taller when we're kids and our organs to grow and develop. And in, when we do research in people, it's very difficult to actually measure growth hormone itself. So we measure a surrogate, like a marker of growth hormone called insulin-like growth factor 1, IGF-1, which is produced... Um, in response to growth hormone. So they go hand in hand. When one goes up, the other one goes up. When one goes down, the other one goes down. So we can rely on IGF-1 as a marker of growth hormone levels, and throughout my presentation, I'll use them interchangeably. So here's what happens to our growth hormone levels throughout our lifespan. They're relatively low when we're first born, but then as we get older, the levels rise, and the peak actually occurs in the second decade. That's when we're growing, right? That's our teenage years. That's when we're getting taller. But then the levels decline very quickly, and they continue to decline as we age. And when people have looked at this pattern, they said, well, maybe because the levels decline, that's why we're aging, that's why we're getting disease, and we're getting disabilities. What happens if we actually bring the levels back up to youthful levels, right? Maybe that will be our fountain of youth. And they've tried it. So in 1990, there was a study done in the United States in men aged 16 and older who were given growth hormone for about six months. And here's what happened. So they noticed that they increased their lean body mass. They reduced their adipose or sorry, fat tissue. The lumbar spine bone mineral density, right, the strength of the spine bone improved, and their skin thickness improved. Looks like they found the fountain of youth, right? Looks great. But they also found that their blood pressure went up, and their blood sugar went up, and many of them developed diabetes. And so something that looked like it might work has actually increased the risk of age-related diseases in people who are already at risk. And so maybe this wasn't such a good idea after all. And when we actually look at nature, right, so a lot of us have spoken about using other organisms um, in identifying drivers of aging. When we look across nature, we find that animals or other model organisms that have low growth hormone levels actually live longer. And that's true for worms, flies, mice, and actually, in some people who are centenarians, we have also found genetic changes that reduce the function of their growth hormone, suggesting that this is a conserved mechanism across all species that allows people to live longer. And so we have decided to look in our cohort of centenarians. What are their levels and what does it predict? So here we're looking at survival in people who are age 90 and older, and this is a woman only, and the green line represents those who have low growth hormone levels, and the orange are those with high. The x-axis is how long they live after we measured their level, and the y-axis is how many of them are still living. And what we find is that after three years of follow-up, those who had low levels of growth hormone actually were twice as likely to still be alive. We didn't see that in men, but we had a very small number. Now, this is growth hormone, so it doesn't only allow us to grow taller, it also allows tissues to grow and cells to grow. So if someone has cancer, right, growth hormone can actually promote the cancer growth as well. So we looked at people who had a history or did not have a history of cancer. So in those who never had cancer in their life, it didn't seem to matter what your growth hormone level was. But in people who did have a history of cancer, either past or present, those with lower levels of growth hormone actually 
survived longer than those with high levels. And so 50% of people lived twice as long who had low levels. And the number of survivors were three times greater at three years of follow-up on those with low levels. Okay, but that's lifespan, right? We talked about, well, okay, maybe we want to live long, but what we really want to do is live healthy. So does it allow people to live healthier? And so we looked at cognitive function or memory uh, in these individuals as well and found that in women who had lower levels of growth hormones, so they were in the lower 33% for their age group, for their population, they were half as likely to have dementia and memory problems, right? So they were not only living longer, but they were living healthier. They were maintaining their cognition. We didn't see that in men. Again, we might have been underpowered. Okay, so that was 90 and plus, right? But you have to get to 90. How do you get to 90? So we looked at people who were middle-aged, 65 and older, and found the exact same thing. So here the orange line represents those with high growth hormone, and the blue lines are those with low growth hormone. And what we found across the board for everyone, men and women independently, was that lower levels were associated with better cognition. That's the top line. They had less multimorbidity, so this is looking at any age-related disease like cancer, uh, cogn cognition problems, uh, diabetes, heart disease. So those with low levels were less likely to develop all of those, and they had less mortality, right? If they had lower levels of growth hormone, they were less likely to die. And when we looked at other studies, we have found a very interesting um, conundrum. So those that only looked at older people found that growth hormone was harmful for them. And those are the studies here on the bottom, right? It increased their risk. Anything above one, that means your risk is more than you know, average. But when we looked at young people, we didn't find that relationship. So we're, we're a little bit puzzled, right? Why are we seeing it in old and young? What's going on here? So we did a very large study in over 400,000 people uh, that, were, that um, ranged in age from their 30s to their 70s to try and figure out this puzzle. And this is a cohort from the UK Biobank, so from the United Kingdom. And I will walk through this figure to explain to you what we found. So when we look on the left side of the curve, right? These are people with low growth hormone levels. And we have two curves. We have a curve for the young, that's the green, and a curve for the older people, that's in red. So those that, who are young and have low levels of growth hormone have a much higher risk for disease and dying. But those who are older are not at as great of a risk, right? Their risk is significantly reduced compared to the young people. On the other hand, when we look at the high levels of growth hormone, most, um, the people who are most at risk are those who are older. Younger are also slightly at risk, but not as much as the older people. And in fact, the lowest risk is here, so somewhere between the 25th and 50th, maybe 75th percentile, right? So we found this dichotomy where something seemed that's good for younger people is actually harmful for older people. And that brings us to the concept of antagonistic pleiotropy. So in nature, we often find things which may be good for the young, but bad for the old, or vice versa. And it is really important for us to recognize that and not necessarily to try to make you know, older people young in the same way that you would just you know, replace something that they're missing. And this is um, really our hypothesis and how we're going about this uh, to explain why that may be. So in youth, right, you need growth hormone for development, growth, injury repair, because it promotes cell growth, cell proliferation, cell survival. But when we get older, we don't need to grow anymore, right? We've reached our maximum height. If we're going to promote growth, we might promote the growth of cancer cells. And when we're actually older, what we want to do is we want to maintain our bodies, right? 
we want to repair and maintenance. So we want to move our energy away from growth and towards maintenance and repair. But if we maintain high levels of growth hormone, we will not be able to maintain our bodies because growth hormone promotes reactive oxygen species generation. It inhibits stress resistance that our bodies naturally possess. And it also inhibits a process called autophagy. And those of you who may have been in the conference for the past few days have heard about that. That's a process where the cell self eats, right? It eats the debris, the toxic proteins that accumulate in the cell and don't allow it to function well. So we want to maintain those processes. We want to eliminate those harmful proteins. So we want to shift energy away from growth and towards repair. Because in aging, we have diminished resilience and accumulation of cellular debris. So here I'm going to show you this complex figure. But what it what its goal is, is really to show you, these are the, the pathway of growth hormone, right? This is how it works. But that's not really why I'm showing it to you. I'm showing you that we have medications already used for other diseases that can block the growth hormone pathway at different um, areas. Some of these are already used for a disease where people make too much growth hormone, called acromegaly. Um, others are used for other conditions. And of course, if we were going to try to use a medication to block growth hormone, we would never want to use it in young people, right? Because they're still growing and developing. So we want to use this drug when somebody is later, uh, older, later in life. But is it going to work, right? Is it still going to work in older um, individuals? So a colleague of mine actually did a study to answer that precise question. He administered a growth hormone blocker to mice that were middle-aged. So they were 80 weeks of age when he started. And what he found was that even if you start this treatment in middle age, it still extended the lifespan of these mice. So the red line are the mice that got the treatment. And you can see that 50% of them were living longer. And so that really allows us to kind of go to the next step and say, OK, we can potentially use this treatment. It's relatively safe because it's already being given to many people for other conditions. And we can start it in middle age, and it will probably still have benefit. And now we're starting a preclinical trial um, in mice for now to test a compound that blocks this pathway to see if it'll prevent um, Alzheimer's disease in mice. So just to summarize what I showed you, aging is under biological control. Um, growth hormone signaling is a conserved pathway of aging. Reduced growth hormone signaling may protect older adults from age-related diseases. And we need to identify biological pathways that regulate aging, which can then lead to the development of therapeutics that delay aging and age-related diseases. Thanks.